Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if there is something that has changed during the past 10 years when it comes to competitive sailing, that's the amount of coaching that is involved. And coaching has been one of the key drivers for the competitive level of sailing to go up. And the question is that is coaching meant for the skiffs just for the young or could, young, or could coaching be uh, a part of classics, a classic racing and, and, and our practice to be better sailors? And who would be a better person to talk about this? Chris Winter. Chris, please join us. My name is Chris Hunter and I come from New Jersey, just outside of New York City. And uh, sailing has been a big part of my life. Uh, I listen to PJ's, ex PJ's explanation about uh, Baltic yachts and, and other guys talking about the, the size of their business and the number of halls they own. And I own a van and uh, what works good, I drive around and I coach people and what works good, I sleep in it. <laughs> In New Jersey in 1965, my father came home one day and he asked my brother and I if he should buy an airplane or a sailboat. And both my brother and I said, buy, buy an airplane. <laughs> That's going to be great fun. Both will have a good time with that. I came home about a week later and there was a small sailboat sitting in the driveway. There was a book about how to sail in the back of the boat. And I'm glad we didn't buy the plane because I think he spent about $400 on the boat and if we bought a plane it never would have flown. <laughs> he took the boat in one hand and we went down to this, it was called a lake when I grew up there and now I realize it was a pond. <laughs> we got in the boat and he started on the first page and we sailed downwind. And uh, we ran aground at the other end of the pond and we walked home. <laughs> and I thought, this is not something I'm going to learn from my father. You know, I'm going I'm to have to go and ask somebody that knows how to do this. That was my first coach. It was in, in Sea Scouts. Uh, scout sailing, and I went and I talked to a couple of guys, and I said, "Yeah, sure, come, come along, and, and we'll help you." And I started to compete in small boats and Optimus dinghies, and in a boat called a Sunfish, which is a, a popular boat in the U.S. And after a while, I realized that people were coming to ask me sometimes, "You know, how did you win that race? What did you do different?" And I started to share with them. And as I went along. I realize, you know, there's sailing, but there's coaching, just like there is in football, just like there is in, in soccer, just like there is in baseball, just like there is in any sport. And I think that it's come, as Esco has said, it's, it's coming to, to the sailing sport in the last 20 years, and I think it's even older than that. You know, when we look at the Blue Marlin, when you look at the, the history of the way people deal with boats, most of these guys have been professional sailors or hired professional sailors to work with them the whole time. And it used to be a little bit more secretive. But as sailing, rather than yachting, became more popular in the Olympics, when, when it moved from big boats to, to everyday boats that people sail, coaches came into play. And the first time I got involved in coaching was uh, for the Olympics in Korea, when they introduced women's 470 sailing. It was a great opportunity for me to work with a couple of girls and, and work with a sailmaker and develop a program. The girls went out to get a gold medal. I was really excited. Since then, I've been doing a lot of Olympic coaching, a lot of sailmaking, and I think that the coaching aspect applies to everybody, regardless of what type of boat you have. Right now, I'm working with Henrik a bit on the 12 meter, but last summer, a young guy came to me on a bicycle in, in the club at OSCO, and he said, can you help me with my Optimus? And I said, no, I don't have any time. I'm sorry. And he came back the next day and he had his wetsuit on and he had his life jacket on. And he said, can you come and help me with my optimism? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what I prepared today is a short presentation on what a coach actually does. What does it mean to be a coach when you're talking about sailboat racing? This is before the Olympics, uh, probably three years before the Olympics, when the Finnish team first started to sail yinlings with the goal of getting a medal in a in the Olympic class in China. This was a regatta in, in Weymouth in England. Let's see. This is a pre-start. There's an English coach there in a rubber boat. 
And what we're going to do is look at the starting sequence here. There's the starting line, two more employees. It's about 20 seconds to go. in the gray motorboat, I'm in another motorboat, and there are probably four or five other coaches there as well. And we're each looking at one team, but we look at all the teams at the same time to see what tricks they have. In the beginning of the video, you could see the English team tack away, and after the racing, the English team had won that race, I sat down with our girls and I said, okay, why did they tack away? What was the motivation there? Why, why were they going to the right-hand side of the course? So we talked about the options they had after the start, the Finnish girls have gotten an excellent start. They're the, the most windward boat here. Uh, they're pointing very high. And they said that they also wanted to go to the right-hand side of the course. So rather than sail a little bit lower and fast with the other boats, they sail higher. And as the other boats stacked onto port, our boat tacked to lower of them and led them back to the right. So the coach's job is, is to discuss what the alternatives are. Uh, and also to talk about what has happened on the race course. You know, people become very focused on their own boat, but from the coach's perspective, with a video camera and watching other boats, you know, I saw that the English boat had gone to the right, and these girls wanted to go to the right also, but they did a great job covering the rest of the fleet, uh, uh, kind of leveraging themselves uh, or, or protecting themselves from the one boat that was levered by itself. If the right wasn't better, they didn't want to be there by themselves. The English boat did make out there, but. From this position, when the other boats started to tack back, we were able to lead them the direction we wanted to go. So that's what a coach does. You, know, you talk about the, uh, the options that you have at different times during the race. You talk about the start itself. If we went to, back to look at the start, you see that all the boats were really close to the starting line. People always ask, were we over, were we close to the starting line? Well, with a coach and coming back and videotaping, you can see accurately you know, where you were. I think this would be a great way for six-meter sailors in Finland to practice. You know, short courses, uh, a lot of practice starts, and a lot of videotaping by a coach or somebody else in the six-meter class. So you could go back and look and see how close you actually were at the start and why people made the choices that they did. How do I get to the next So this is the same same series sailing agreement. And this is a windward mark. There's the windward mark. So this is a Finnish boat with their spinnaker pole up rounding the mark. The first three boats have rounded the mark and they're doing barrel as spinnaker says. Spinnaker's going up. There are four more boats coming behind, but not a lot. There's a short offset mark and, and there isn't going to be a lot of traffic, so in this case, the Finnish girls go to a giant set the blue spinnaker. So that was a great opportunity to look at what they did during the, during the maneuvers that they have to make. How they got the pole up, but they jived at the same time. With the pole up and a small jib like a Yeland has, they were able to rotate the spinnaker all the way around to the, to the leeward side during the jive and then move the pole across. 
So as a coach, you can look at the maneuvers that are being made, you can discuss them, you can also look at what the other boats have done, the difference between their maneuvers and our maneuvers, and what works best. Like uh, somebody said, you know, one design sailboat racing, the boats are basically the same, but somebody always wins. Well, very often the same person seems to win. So let's look at what they did. You know, let's see what they did and see how we can incorporate it into our program. One thing we talked about after this session when we were looking at the videotape was how quickly boats turn. Some of the boats were turning much too fast. So they wanted to do a jive set as well, but by turning as quickly as they did, they lost so much speed, there was immediate separation of, of one boat length, one and a half boat lengths. You know, you spend a lot of time and a lot of years and a lot of money to get your boat up to speed. In Olympic sailing, if you give away one, one boat length, you know, it's pretty expensive. One more video if we can. So that's coaching. Video from off the boat, from a rubber boat, the quality of the video is not great. I'm trying to steer with one hand, videotape with the other hand, and not spill my beer. <laughs> yes. This is another type of video coaching. I'll start that one. Great. How do we get that one? Yep. So this is an onboard camera on a 49er. This is a Ukrainian team. And they're trying something very difficult here, which is trying to sail downwind without the spinnaker up in a 49er. It's something they know they have to do as they go around the Woodward March, so they spend a lot of time practicing it. It's not great quality video, but you do get to see what they're doing on the boat and the fact that they know how to swim. <laughs> so they went back and practiced more and more and more, and you guys asked what you can do to get better as sailors in the six meter class or in any classic boat. That's what you do. You practice, you practice, and you practice. Here's another one. They just on the bear away around the Woodward Mark, and they didn't capsize because they practiced. Now they're putting the spinnaker on. Back on the trapeze, and these guys are really focused on something to their right. And this is something that's really interesting to watch. So they're up to speed, they have the spinnaker up, they're on starboard tack going down the run. I remember watching, and another boat out grounded in front of them. And there it is. So going downwind on starboard tack, they were able to bear away. They were able to use the rules to their advantage and approach this port tack boat and jive at the same time they reached the port tack boat. So that's something we discussed afterwards also. How do you go about using the rules to your advantage uh, and using the, the tactical situation to your advantage? And now if you can put it on all the pictures. Slide show. Okay, we've been talking about Sparkman and Stevens designs. They also designed the Everyman's boat. This is a Lightning that Sparkman and Stevens designed. Fantastic boat. It's been around for a long time. You look at the evolution of boats. We had the, the Baltic evolution of boats and how they become lighter and stronger and, and what you do with them. Well, it's happened to all the one design classes also. People push the rules. Uh, in most cases, the rules evolve. You're limited by the rules, but the idea is that you all go the same speed and you build a boat that can last for a fairly long time. This is a great design. It was never underbuilt. It's a boat that weighs 700 pounds, 350 kilos, 320 kilos. So it was a, a well-built boat. And if you took a boat from the 1980s and refit it so it's got all the modern hardware, the boat itself is probably still very sound. So it's a Sparkman and Stevens design, great racing. I sailed these boats as a kid. And every chance I get, I would still sell lightning. I coach some guys for the world championship. <coughs> and one of the things we look at as a coach is the amount of headstay sag, okay, the amount of sag in the, the forward wire on the sail. And that's relative to every boat. That's relative to the 12 meter. Uh, that's relative to any boat that has a four sail. That's relative to the six meter. And it's relative to a lightning or a four seven meter. The force they has to be controlled. You have to know how much it sags. And it's something that's hard to see from on the boat. So as a coach working with these guys, when I see what I think is the correct amount of force they say, we mark everything. 
I usually have a radio contact with the guys in the boat. I say, okay, now you're up to speed. We might have two boats sailing together. If one of them is going considerably faster, we try to mark everything. Stop where you are right now, put a mark on all the ropes, and let's go back and find out why you're going faster. And a lot of times it's the four stays that we're looking at. So that's one thing a coach could help you with. Uh, I think when you have a velocity prediction program, it's great. You know how fast the boat should go. I get called in to say, how come we're not reaching the, the speeds that we're supposed to reach? How come we don't reach the velocity prediction program? So you go through a, a whole cycle. You know, is the boat set up right? Are the sails set up properly? What do we have to do to make sure we're up to speed? With a VPP, with a velocity prediction program, you use that. When design racing, it's a lot easier. You look at the boat next to you. Wow, he's going faster than we are. What should we do? Well, ask the coach. The coach will tell you, you know, this is what they're doing differently. This is what you can do to improve your speed. And when you're up to speed, my advice is to help the other guys. You know, I think it's fantastic in finish sailing. Uh, most of the guys help each other. You know, we're talking about the high boat having coaching, uh, people coming into new classes, and I think we need to expand sailing in Finland, and one way we do that is by sharing what we know with each other. Yes. Okay, here's three lightnings going upwind. These guys are flatter. The first boat is flatter than the other two boats. It's not heeled over as much. Interestingly enough, it's in front of the other two boats. You know? So if I was coaching the second or the third boat, I'd say, look, what we should be doing is being a bit flatter. And one thing that's very good for me as a coach about taking pictures and using videotape is honesty. I can ask the second boat, you know, why were you guys so heel over? We weren't heel over, we were flat. So, hmm, I don't think so. <laughs> you look at the hiking style, look at the four-stay sag again. These guys have just the right amount of four-stay sag. They've also set the boat up so they're sailing it flatter. That could be a traveler adjustment or, or a main sheet adjustment. But the boat is going faster because they've done more practice and they know how to set the boat up for the conditions that they're sailing in. This is a team I was coaching for the Olympics in Athens. It's a, a girls team from Bermuda. A couple things you can see from on the boat, but you can see from the rubber boat where I'm coaching. One thing I'm looking at is the uh, up here where the grid, where the telltale on the jib is uh, flowing straight back. And the girls can see that, but they can't see the whole picture at the same time. They can't see the, they can't see the top telltale in the mainsail and the telltale in the jib at the same time. And that's one thing the coach can see. And again, we go back and say, you know, now the boat looks like it's set up properly, go ahead and mark everything right there. The other thing I look at is a hiking technique for the girl here. We want to make sure that she can last four years during an Olympic campaign. Her legs are a little bit straight. Her knees need to be bent a little bit more. She's going to start to run into knee problems. So you look at the physical aspect as a coach. You look at the sailboat as a, as a project. And you also look at how you develop the sailboat and the sails. What needs to be done to make the boat faster and have it fit within the rules. This is again the same thing. I'm looking at this is on a lightning. But it's really important that the telltale at the top of the jib flows straight back. So I look at it. I have them trim the sail real slowly until it's over tensioned and the telltale starts to slow, and then ease a little bit and mark it there. If things go well, your boat has a window in the sail, and when the person is hiking, they can look up and see that. So we can discuss exactly what we're talking about. One thing that's important from the coaching perspective, and when I start a new project, is we all write down the words that we're going to use so that we're talking about the same thing. Uh, I coach some girls from New Zealand, some girls from Australia. I speak English from New Jersey. They speak English from Australia and New Zealand. And we could talk about everything except sailing. When they use the sailing terms, I had no idea what they were talking about. They were using totally different words. One very interesting thing is we establish good terms. And I had been living in Finland for a while. There are some girls in New Zealand and Australia that, uh, that know the numbers in Finnish. They know number one through number ten. So we could sit in the crowded parking lot, we could say, well, I think you should shut your spreaders at Cox Nelia. <laughs> <laughs> so you could have an open conversation, but talk about very specific things by using the Finnish words. So we were able to keep something secret, but uh, it was a, a language that we had developed, and the terms we used uh, were always the same. So the New Zealand girls could talk to the Australian girls, and I could talk to them. 
And I think when you look at a bigger book, when we look at the 12 meter now, it's really important that we write down the terms that we're going to use and everybody uses the same ones. So when somebody says, okay, we'll pull back the brace, well, the Australian guys use the after guy on the spinnaker, that's the brace, and the American guy uses after guy. So we have to pick the correct words that we're going to use. A lot of times I've coached teams, bigger boat teams, that have four or five different languages on board, and it's really important that you narrow it down to the words that you're going to use. This is another thing that a coach sees, but the athlete really sees. At Olympic level competition, I've seen boats disqualified from a race because their main sail is over the black band at the top. So at Olympic level competition, you have to count on everything. You have to count on the fact that something you can't see might be a big problem for you. So from off the boat, the coach looks at that. The other thing we see here is that the top tail tail and the main sail is very stalled. So the main sail is probably over trim. This was some Australian girls I was coaching. I like the tail tail at the top. They always use a, an Australian bird feather. From off the boat, you can see a lot about the sail trip that boats have. This is a lightning going upwind, and from behind, I can see that the main sail looks just right. The angle of heels right on the edge, maybe a little bit too much, but they've reduced the wetted surface by getting this one rail out of the water. The other thing that sees me, that I see, and it scares me a little bit, is the flag, fact that the, the main sheet is too blocked already. So they're fine for the conditions they're in, but if the breeze increases just a little bit, they're not going to be able to get enough main sheet tension. So again, it's somebody off the boat, looking at the boat, seeing what you can improve. Looking at sails again, this is a Doyle main sail. This is the girls from Bermuda. And we found that the mast was too bent. It's too bent because I can see the inversion wrinkles in the mainsail, going from the clue of the mainsail to the middle of the mast. So we had to work on a way to straighten the mast. And I think in any class, it's a coordination between either a coach or a sailmaker helping you set your boat up so that you get the most out of your sails. You can look at the maneuvers people make during races as a coach, and you can videotape it and take pictures. These are some lightnings approaching a windward mark. It's a boat from Ecuador. Coming into the mark, this is the boat from Ecuador here. It's a little bit crowded. It's going to be really tough to have a passing lane from where they are. They've got five boats right in front of them. So you watch them go right into a job. This is something we had discussed beforehand. What are the options? Well, as we come to the windward mark, we have a playbook, just like a soccer team has a playbook. Just like you see the guy at the Olympics now with the hockey team. Okay, you gotta do this, you do this, you do this. Well, these guys coming into the windward mark, they have an entry strategy. How are we gonna enter the windward mark here? And what's our exit strategy? Well, if there are five boats in front of us and we haven't performed as well as we wanted to on the first beat, we're gonna have to do a jive set. So they go to their playbook, while the guys have the same language, and they talk about what they're going to do as they exit the mark. So one thing I do as a coach with each team is to <laughs> develop a playbook. What are the plays that you have in your book? What are the, the moves that you can make? Uh, first, you've got to consider the rules. Second, you've got to consider what has happened uh, on the first beat, what has happened on the run, and how you approach the next mark. What is your entry strategy and what is your exit strategy to that mark? This is a great picture. It's a close-up picture of the Bermuda team sailing downwind. I sail dragons quite a bit, and it's a different style of coaching. This is coaching from a coach boat. In the dragon, it's what I call a player coach. And I think it's gonna, gonna take place in six meters, it's gonna take place on the 12 meter, is you're participating in the team. So when I'm participating in the dragon team, when I'm one of the three crew members on the boat, we talk very specifically about what each person's role is. Who's going to be looking back at when? So this girl is looking back at the breeze, I've started sailing with a, a Swedish dragon now, and we have somebody new on the back, on the bow of the boat looking back, and we're developing uh, a catalog of what she should be looking at. Uh, you're looking at wind, you're looking at wind in a particular area, and you're also giving information on the other boats. So you can coach from on the boat as well as from off the boat. And I think that would be helpful for the six meter class in Finland, 
You know, we get seven, eight boats out practicing. Maybe if you get a coach on each boat or you get a more experienced six-meter sailor on the boat with you, they can help share the information. Sometimes it's really obvious, you can say, ah, I see where your problem is, you know, I, can, I, I see where, where things are going wrong. And for me, as a coach, it's incredibly helpful in sailing tactically. I've learned so much by being a coach, so you guys can do the same thing. If you're on a six meter, sail on another six meter as a coach and watch what happens. And it'll help you develop your team. It'll also open your eyes as to how other people are going about doing things. This is great to talk about the physical part. This girl has a spinnaker guy in her hand the whole time. So a little bit of wave or a little increase in wind velocity, she's able to lean back and pull that. We had a long talk about her positioning on the boat. For a long time she was doing this just sitting on the deck. And we talked about the fact that you have to put your feet on the floor. So that when you lean back, you have something to push against. So again, it's, it's taking it to the highest level. It's taking it to, to a level that helps people at the the Olympics when they get there. This is a main sheet trimmer. She's down to the same thing. She's able to plant her feet on the bottom of the boat, steer, and pull the mainsail every time there's a small wave. The other thing you see from this picture is a very slight windward heel angle. So they've reduced the drag on the boat. They particularly reduced the drag on the rudder. She could basically let go of the rudder and the boat's going to go straight. And we practice doing that quite a bit. How can you sail the boat without putting your hand on the rudder? Well, they do it by heeling the boat to different angles. They do it by the amount of spinnaker rotation and how far out the mainsail goes. So with enough practice, you can do it too. These are the same girls when they got to the Olympics. And they've taken it a step further. It's a little bit too windy. You can see the bow is pretty deep <coughs> in the water. They have to move their weight around a lot. So the girl has come off the bow. She should be looking back. But we did a lot of practice in Athens and heavy air just before the Olympics, and then it turned out to be light air most of the time. But practice makes perfect. Another thing to discuss is, you know, in the meter classes, in almost all the small keelboat classes, the spinnaker pole is too short. That's a design problem that's existed for a long time. People have started to fly the spinnakers a little bit farther away from the boat to make the, the spinnaker more effective to get it away from the mainsail. So it used to be a rule until about 1980 something, that you had to have the spinnaker pole close to the end of the, or the spinnaker close to the end of the spinnaker pole. But that's no longer the case. So you can separate them. You can take the pole down if you want to. Olympic sailing is fantastic in some ways, and it's a disaster in some ways. It brings up the best in some people and the worst in some people. The best I've seen is these girls sailing in a heavier race in Athens. They lost their spinnaker pole, and they were in contention for a couple of good good races, and the Danish team came over, came over and said, you know, we want to beat you desperately, but we don't want to beat you because you don't have a spinnaker ball, so take our extra one. That's the nicest thing I've seen coaching in, in the Olympics. This is what every coach wants to see. This is like a ballet. This is the Australian guys in Beijing who went on to get a gold medal in the 470 class. What do you see? These guys are rounding the lower mark to go upwind. Where are they looking? They're both looking upwind. Coaching before the Olympics in Athens, I was watching all the yearlings round the lower mark. There are 14 boats. And I look, and I see four eyeballs. I see two people looking upwind from 14 boats. The rest of them are down here somewhere reaching for ropes. These guys have practiced enough. They've taken it to the level where when they put their hand out, they know whatever something's going to be. It's like flying a fighter jet. As a fighter jet pilot has to look down, well, let's see, where is it? <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. You have to be this good. They got that good by practice. It looks like a ballet because both of the guys are in exactly the same physical position. They both moved into the boat to roll it a little bit. They're using the rolling of the boat as much as the rudder to steer the boat. They're about halfway around the mark. Both of the sails are sheeted perfectly. They're not oversheeted. Most of the time when I look at boats rounding the lower mark, the chips pull all the way in. Well, these guys have figured out that in order for the boat to accelerate, the sail trim always has to be at the correct angle for the, for the boat. We saw a videotape about the starts. This is just two pictures about what a coach sees at the start. We took a picture yesterday of a uh, blue marlin and the deck layout, 
and I went to work immediately. What I've drawn in here is a green line, so that when we round the windward mark, the spinnaker after guy gets trimmed. Where does the spinnaker after guy go? Well, it goes to the primary winch on the boat, which means one of our 13 guys is going to have to be standing there pulling the rope in. Two of the guys are going to have to be standing at the pedestal. Somebody's going to have to be up here because uh, after a guy has gone around the forest and it's come back to our spinnaker, which is down here in the hatch, <coughs> somebody's going to have to help the spinnaker out of the hatch. Somebody's going to have to be up here putting the pole up. For the pole to stay up in the air, somebody's going to have to be over here at this blue rope pulling the topping lift to keep the pole up there. So it's nice to be a player coach in this situation, to have the boat ready. We can do a fair amount of practice before we ever go sailing. We can define what each person's role is. Well, I'm number 12 on the boat, so I'm back somewhere in the cockpit. Uh, Alan's going to be number five or six in the boat, so Alan's going to be just behind this group of winches. We sailed with Alan in a, a regatta in Copenhagen uh, last year. And very interesting because everybody's doing their job. And I heard Alan talk to another guy, and the other guy said, well, look at number one, he's upside down. <laughs> he was the pole guy up in the front of the boat. He was wrapped around the pole, pointed straight down. But everybody did their job. He stayed on the boat. And we went on to do well in that regard. So player coach on the boat, coaching from off the boat. Sharing the information that you have with the other sailors. And I think that's the future of finished sailing. That's the future of the classic boats. One thing I saw from the classic boats and then the, the Baltic boats that have been developed is that from the beginning, since people have been sailing boats, since the Vikings were out there, they want to race against each other and they want to take it to the highest level. I look at this gooseneck on the, on the table up here and the guys that developed the gooseneck for Blue Marlin in 1936 wanted to build the lightest, strongest one they could. And you look at boats being built today, they want to build the lightest, strongest ones they can. So that hasn't changed much. And the competitive nature of sailboat tracing hasn't changed much. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you so much.